Today, we are super lucky to have a wonderful friend of mine to talk through all things egg donation and egg freezing. Let me introduce you to the amazing Dr. Sandy Chuan. Hello. So Sandy has been named an exceptional woman in medicine four years in a row. She's board certified as an OBGYN and a board certified reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist. I'll try saying that when you're drunk. And has been named <laughs> Castle Connolly's top doctor for six years in a row. She's a partner at the San Diego Fertility Center and specializes in egg donation, surrogacy, and complex IVF cases. Sandy emigrated to the US when she was eight from Taiwan as in, and is fluent in Mandarin. First of all, Sandy, welcome to the IVF Daddies podcast. Thrilled that you're here today. I'm going to pick your brains on multiple things, so I hope you're prepared. Absolutely, I'm excited to be here as well. Such a pleasure, as always. One of the most important parts of the IVF process is obviously eggs. And when I chose my egg donor, it was very much a, you're really pretty, and didn't delve into more of the details around what it actually entailed to be an egg donor, female biology. I'm a guy, like I'm a gay man. Don't, <laughs> unless you haven't figured that out. Um, <laughs> Wasn't obvious. <laughs> um, and so really, what I'd love to get from you today is a sense of how do how does egg donation happen? Egg donors, how do you make sure they're good candidates? Tell me more about from start to finish, from a medical perspective, how that works. Absolutely. I think obviously you should pick your egg donor because you think she's pretty, has a lovely smile. All those things are also important. Sometimes it's a gut feeling about a person. But I think when you're thinking about IVF success, and what it entails, I think it would be good for one to become informed of exactly how a woman's body works so that you can make an informed decision. Because there might be times when someone maybe medically doesn't look as prolific as somebody else, but at least you're making that decision before you go into it saying, I'm prioritizing the way she looks or something else about her background rather than just the body versus somebody else might say, listen, I only got one chance to do this. I wanna make sure I have the best chance of ensuring success and so i'm going to prioritize the medical aspect and sometimes it's a balance of both you will bear with me because i need to take it back into physiology so that everybody can understand the things that i'm asking people to think about when they're picking their egg donors and why would a bunch of guys know anything about the menstrual cycle so i'm going to teach you and then if you should have a daughter like you i do then you'll be really prepared to educate her too um, when she gets to that age yes Perfect. I always explain to everybody that a woman is born with all the eggs that she's going to have. And when you start going through puberty, every month your body will allocate a group of eggs to go into competition to ovulate. So I would say a woman ovulates one egg a month, but she actually sends out a bunch of candidates to compete because you're actually wasting the rest of those eggs that have been allocated but don't ovulate because your brain controls that process and we're not meant to have multiple babies at the same time so the brain puts out only enough hormone for one out of that group to ovulate sometimes a second that's how you get fraternal twins but the rest are wasted so when we do IVF what we do is we make use of those wasted opportunities by giving the woman extra hormones to support the growth of those eggs now eggs live inside little follicles these little sacs that they develop in and when they get into that recruitment phase then we can see them on ultrasound and so before anyone really including your egg donor starts IVF part of the evaluation is looking at the ovarian reserve and what does that mean first we do an ultrasound to take a look and see how many small follicles she has so when they get to that stage you collect a little fluid then I can see them on ultrasound the eggs that are in your reserve they're in follicles too, but they don't have any fluid, so you can't see them on ultrasound, they're invisible to us. But looking at that number is important because the more you have in your reserve, the more you'll put out per month. But also that's my kind of my starting point. So I always give an analogy that when you're doing IVF, it's as though you're running a little mini marathon. And so how many follicles you have is your starting point. It's like how many people signed up for the race, right? And, and then from that point, you are gonna lose candidates along the way, but if you start out with a higher number, theoretically you have more competitors and you may get to the finish line with more candidates. So the first part of Wayne Reserve is just looking surely at the ultrasound, how many follicles does she have? 
The second is you measure AMH, which is a hormone produced by those small follicles. And the higher that number theoretically correlates with quantity, but it also correlates with the robustness, meaning how responsive are those follicles likely to be when I give you extra hormones to support their growth. If you're in a normal range, then I would expect about 70 to 80% of those follicles to start to grow when you start the stimulation. And how many follicles in general does somebody have? And when you talk about wastage, what does that mean? I would say that if someone is under 30, her body should be putting out at least 15 follicles per month because that would signify to me that the reserve is reasonable for age. But just like how we vary in height as humans, you know, your kind of follicle count can vary. So not all women who are 25 have the exact same count. So you can have someone who has just 15 and you can have someone who has 40 or 50. That's on the extreme higher end. I would say most of our egg donors, when we're screening them and we do the ultrasound, we see somewhere between 15 to 25-ish as a normal average range. But certainly there are those women who have more. And then when we talk about wastage, what I mean is if you're going through a normal menstrual cycle and there's only enough hormone for one to grow, the rest of them just don't get enough fuel to allow them to develop. And so they just go away. So they don't go back in your reserve. You're just basically, they get reabsorbed by the body on their own and that's and they it. They just disappear. They just and, disappear. And they, those follicles are sitting in the ovaries. You said a woman is born with all of her eggs. Does that then mean that, say for example, you're a 30 year old woman, yeah. woman, your eggs are older than 30 because they must be produced when you're in utero, yeah. yeah, when your mother is pregnant with you, yeah. You accumulate your gametes when you're still developing, but theoretically, I suppose you could count year zero, right? And so when you're born, it's year one. But I think what you have to remember is that we, as women, have such a huge disadvantage because we never regenerate new eggs, unfortunately. Men make new sperm every couple of months and they're always making new cells. And the egg is the only cell in the body that doesn't regenerate. And so when you think about that, there's two main things that contributes to ovarian aging when you think about quality declining. So we have a quantity decline because we're depleting our supply. So I think that's what can happen with the egg. The longer it's sitting there and waiting to be ovulated, waiting to be used, metabolically, energetically, you start to lose the efficiency of the cell. And that really then impacts how well that egg can combine with sperm to become an embryo because the early part of embryo development is greatly dependent on all the resources that is within the egg itself. The egg is about 100 times bigger than the sperm. So I'm not saying that the sperm is not important. It absolutely is an important part of the reproductive process, but the egg carries a lot more of the weight. So I always give analogy that to me, the egg is like the computer mm -hmm. and the sperm is like the software. And so you need both for things to happen, but you can have the best software in the world, but if your computer won't turn on, nothing is going to happen. If you have a software that's average, maybe it's not perfect, but you have a really great and fast computer, then it can compensate for the software. There's this thought in reproductive biology that a good quality egg could help to carry the weight of a sperm that may not be as good in quality, but the vice versa isn't true. So you can have great quality sperm, but it's not gonna be able to help the quality of the egg. Now, if you have eggs with poor quality, a poor quality sperm could burden it further, but it doesn't help it dramatically correct quality. That's the thing the egg does most of the heavy lifting. And so what I was saying is that energetically, it changes. But then the second thing is that as we get older, we just start ovulating more eggs that have an incorrect number of chromosomes. So when you're you know, 30 or under, maybe about one third of the embryos you create will be abnormal. By the time you're 35, about 50%. And so that's why when you're thinking about selecting an egg donor, I have lots of intended parents that are obviously picking donors that are under 30. But sometimes I have someone who's got a sister or a friend who they want to use as their known egg donor, but that woman is a little bit older in let's say 35 to 37. And I think then one of the things you have to really consider is this process of ovarian aging. Obviously you're picking them because there's a special connection, special reason, 
but you do have to understand about what that implication is when you're going for treatment and knowing that maybe you might need more rounds. Women who are 35, 37 can certainly have babies through IVF successfully, but sometimes it's not successful the very first round because of these factors. That's why optimally, you should pick someone who's 30 or under to be your egg donor. She would ideally have 15 follicles or more but at minimum 15. Is that per ovary or total? No, total. And then we would love to see an AMH. Our cutoff for our egg donor database is 1.5 for an AMH. That tells me that the reserve is normal. They should have a good and normal responsiveness. But I would say that if you're someone who's looking, for example, to have more than one child in one round of IVF, then you should be picking a donor that maybe has a higher follicle count, higher AMH level, 2, 2.5 and above, follicle count 25 and above, because you're just starting with a higher, higher ground in terms of number. After the end of the day, it's a numbers game, right? Now, that being said, I think women are different. So even though I could get 10 different women, we're all 25, right? Who all have 25 to 30 follicles, in the end, their responsiveness when they actually go through the cycle may still be a bit different. So I always, I always think of things in categories. That's how my mind works. And so I think of in biology, we always think about the bell curve. What that means is you have a lot of people who are in the middle range, and then there's always the outliers, people who do better and people who do worse than you expect. And that's the same for women when they're going through ovarian stimulation as egg donors, you know, I have my average response group and then i have my super prolific donors right um and i have my donors who weed out more candidates than i would expect so for example if i start out with 25 to 30 follicles i would say that most women will get somewhere between 15 to 18 maybe 20 eggs at most and then from that that could translate after the attrition into maybe something between five to eight blastocyst embryos. And from there, if you were to do genetic testing to weed out the abnormal ones, you might get four to six back. And that gives you really good odds. That's a great cycle. But I have the donors that from that same number of follicles to start could end up with eight to 12 embryos that you send off for testing and end up with six to 10 normals. That's a super prolific donor. And then there are those who get that many and then in the finish line get three to four. And so they're all different. And so that's why past cycle history can be helpful. Now, at the end of the day, they're young. So I would say two thirds of them are gonna do quite well, right? Probably a little bit more than two thirds, I would say 80% is gonna be either the average or prolific group. But there's always that smaller percentage, maybe 15%, you know, 10, 15 percentage that may be that they get a lot of eggs or a lot of follicles, but because there's just almost too many that the body weeds out more, right? So that's why we always talk about looking at past history. If you're that intended parent that has higher expectations from your cycle, what do I mean by that? I always tell everybody, your goal or our expectation for human biology is that in one round of IVF, from a young egg donor, I should be able to get enough embryos for at least one child. I would say most of my intended parents will get pregnant within the first one or second embryo that we use to transfer, for example, into your surrogate. I would say 95% of people probably have their baby by their second embryo. Now, that being said, out of four human embryos, we typically get one to two babies. And when we're just looking at them, giving them a grade visually, not a perfect science, like judging a book by its cover. So sometimes the really pretty looking one is in your champion, right? And the more average looking ends up being the baby. So there's, it's not perfect. So there are times when people might need a third embryo that would probably get 97% at my clinic. My 97 to 98% of my patients there. It's pretty rare in an egg donor situation that I only have one baby out of four, but occasionally maybe 2% of the time it happens. So if I'm Understand it correctly. Yes. Basically, you're going to test somebody, they're going to come back with numbers. Yep. You're going to start off with, say, a higher number of follicles, a lower number of eggs, so because not every egg is going to work, and then 
an even lower number of embryos. So it's almost like every stage like of race. the process, is you're losing those people in, in the race that you were saying. Exactly. Right? Um, and so then with age, as the quality declines, the, the starting number is lower. So you're yes. going to end up with lower and lower. So yes. is that the reason why egg donors are under 30 generally? Generally speaking, yes, that's why. It's not that I can't do IVF on someone who's older and try to gather whatever opportunity we can get from that woman, but it is a numbers game, right? It's quality, but it's also numbers plays into it a lot. And so that's why it would be more ideal. Not that I haven't taken care of egg donors that are 31, 32, because when you think about it, lots of women get pregnant right that 31 32 naturally and do great but i think it's all about optimizing so that kind of then leads me onto the question of egg freezing i think a lot of women start thinking about egg freezing when they're approaching 35 because that's the number that's in our head growing up like oh my gosh at 35 i'm considered advanced maternal age or they say these really unkind things like calling us geriatric at 35 which is ridiculous uh, we're certainly not geriatric, but I think it is because for the eggs, they've been around for 35 years and it hits a critical point. But then after 35, you see this, the curve goes down like this. And so you start losing eggs faster, the quality starts declining faster. So yes, I have lots of women that come to see me around 35 or older, closer to 40, because they are realizing, you know, maybe they haven't found the right dreams, one. The right one. Again, just like egg donors that we're choosing for our IVF cycle, it's more optimal before 30, right? Or at least in your early 30s before 35. So for my own child, I would say in her early to mid 20s. And I guess what you're doing by taking out the eggs and freezing them, that they stop aging, right? They, so if you do it 25, you're 25. Yeah, so it's interesting. Yeah, I always tell people, we always think of the ovaries and the uterus as being linked together as reproductive organs, but they really function really differently, right? Eggs go through this aging process and they're born with us. Yes, the uterus is born with us too, but the way that it functions doesn't have these cellular mechanics that the eggs does. It just needs to be a fertile ground for implantation, really. And so the uterus doesn't age with us. And so woman's IVF success rate is really dependent on the quality of the eggs, which is greatly dependent on her chronological age. But the uterus is not the determining factor. Not that women can't have uterine problems that make things harder, but in general, it's not the age of the uterus that factors in. Interesting. So you freeze your eggs, 25, you can keep them frozen for 10, 25, how, how? As long as you want. It's the freezing and thawing that impacts the quality, not the length of time. We're using vitrification now, which is basically flash freezing. We've been able to get better success rates mm -hmm. in the laboratory. You know, the, the old technique of you doing it with freezing, ice crystal formation, all those things can negatively impact how well it'll function after you saw it. Um, but flash freezing, you're really minimizing that. And so that's why eggs can do so much better now. But I guess that's optionality, really. It gives you options. There are no absolute guarantees in life. So people who just say, freeze your eggs and everything will be perfect. I certainly don't want to paint that picture because I don't want someone to think of their frozen eggs as this 100% backup. So they, even when they meet the right person, that they don't start thinking about that reproductive process for themselves. I think it's one of those things though, where you're buying yourself the opportunity, the potential, right? And if you're really not in the right situation, that you don't have to make a decision just because you feel that pressure. As women, it's just the unfair biology, right? I had my kids in residency, which was definitely a very difficult time to do that. <laughs> but I, I grew up in a different time when egg freezing wasn't a reality for women of my generation. I'm almost 50. And so back then, it was very experimental, if anything at all. And so after I did my fertility rotation, I panicked and saw very young women struggle with infertility in early 30s. And I thought, oh goodness, you know, I was going to wait till I was done with everything. And I calculated in my head, I was like, oh, I'll be like in my late 30s and I wanted a bigger family. So I made the hard decision of saying, I'm going to do this while I'm in residency and 
working, you know, 80, 100 hours a week. Um, but it was the right thing given Not my options. Time. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's the right thing for me. I don't regret it. But I don't want my child to have to make those same difficult decisions. And so even though I know it's not a guarantee, I usually am always I'm brainwashing her a little bit. And I do think this generation of young women that we're seeing now are going to grow up seeing more about this and this option. I just don't want to have a myth out there, though, that it's the foolproof plan. I think they need to know that it's not a 100% guarantee until you actually saw the eggs and use and use them and see what embryos become of it. And because and, and, I guess you have that natural attrition, attrition rate. rate exactly. Right? So then, I guess a, a question that to me would come to mind is: Is there an optimal number of eggs to freeze, mm-hmm. and should you keep doing it until you get to the number? Like, sure, I love everybody to have like twenty-five to thirty eggs. I'm a little greedy, but most people can't get that in one round. It's also can be costly mm. unless you have coverage. So I know that's a realistic limitation for people. But having numbers on your side, again, it's a buffer against the unpredictable. That's the way I explain to patients. And I also think sometimes people don't know exactly what their family plans are. They may be really happy with one child, or maybe they may decide later on in life after they've had two kids that they want another one. You just don't know how your life is going to change or how your feelings are going to change about it. So sometimes I always say to people, listen, you can freeze your eggs. I'm not saying you should kind of rush back to use them. Try to get pregnant on your own when you're at the place that you're ready to do that. Maybe if you are older when you first try, think about coming to do a fertility evaluation first so that you can make sure your partner has a great sperm count because if he's got a low sperm count, you could be spinning your wheels for six months and just Ovarian aging is happening, right? And it's happening a lot faster at that point. Make sure your fallopian tubes are open. Make sure you don't have anything growing in your uterus that's gonna cause problems for implantation. And then you could get an assessment of what your ovarian reserve looks like at that point. What I'm hearing is a lot of empowering yourself to understand your own fertility. Sure. And that is something that I guess a lot of people don't really do or know or even understand right it's interesting i think we get sex education right but i don't know that anybody truly spends the time to teach women about how their biology works even as a medical student we had one lecture on ovarian physiology but i don't know that even back then when i think back to myself sitting there in my classroom as a medical student even then truly understood like what that meant for my fertility because it never even struck me at that point to think about oh i'm pursuing this career that's really time consuming and leads to potentially delayed childbearing and high stress all these things i never thought about what about my own fertility it just wasn't a thing i would love it would be us in a world where egg freezing is commonly discussed it's mm-hmm. destigmatized it's almost like the Botox of the day. Do you know what I mean? It's one of those... Botox com- for your ovaries. But it's one of those conversations yeah. that people have. Sure. And it's not taboo and it's not hidden. It's a conversation that you can sit at the dinner table and say, are you thinking about it? Have you thought about it? Because I think when I look at my child, one of my, my daughter, I'm like, I, why wouldn't I allow her? Or sure. why wouldn't I give her the opportunity to do that? Sure. To empower her. Yeah to have options. I think in life it's about options. At one point my daughter said to me, I don't, mom, I don't even know if I wanna have kids. And I said, I understand that you're young and you don't know what you want, right? And I said, but you know what? If you do this, at least it gives you a choice, an option to decide later. I think it is a, could be a life-changing event, right? For a woman that maybe does want it all traveling or career or whatever it is or enjoying time with her partner i do have now more and more couples also coming to just freeze embryos okay Mm -hmm. because they know we're not you know we're in our early 30s but we're not ready to have children yet but we know we want to have two or three and so we are going to create some embryos and bank embryos first i also think that's quite empowering and smart and i think more young couples should also be educated on that. It's not just freezing your eggs. Once you have a partner, 
I also think maybe you just create embryos and maybe you don't need to use those embryos for your first child, but maybe when you're 38 or 39 and you want to have a second baby, if it becomes difficult, that's when that can come into a great benefit for those couples as well. So I don't think it's just about women freezing eggs alone. It could be couples who are just not yet ready. This conversation could go on for hours. It could. I feel like I'm taking up all your time. And I find this absolutely fascinating. And I think we are going to have you back on the podcast. And anybody who's listening, if you've got questions, anything that you think has come up today that you would like Dr. Sandy Chuan, maybe you can become our resident expert. Um, chats with Chuan. Chats yeah. with Chuan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Put any questions you have in the comments section, we will ask her to answer them. Thank you so much. You are a superstar and I cannot say how much I appreciate your time and talking through female physiology and eggs. Thank you so much.